now studying that sixth stage of history, the age of grace, where man is to relate to God under the principle of grace. And last week we began the most important study of this, showing the transition that had to take place when the way of life was changed from living under the law of Moses as a principle to living under the principle of grace. And it was not an easy transition. We saw last week how that they had to change their expectation from looking for a kingdom that would be founded here on earth to looking in this age for a kingdom that focuses in heaven, where we see our citizenship as being in heaven, from which also we constantly and expectantly await the return of our Lord and Savior. Also, we saw how that uh, the way of God's dealing has changed from having his focus on the Jew to now having his focus on the Gentiles. And under the age of law, the Gentile could be saved, but he had to convert to be a Jew and come through the Jews. Today, the Jew has to come to a Gentile-dominated church and believe and receive God's blessing. Today, the Gentile primarily is God's clients to take the gospel to the world. In the other age of law, it was primarily the Jew. That was the focus. So those were two things that had to had to take place. And the book of Acts is the book that faithfully records the history of how this transition took place. Now today we're going to study the transition from the law of Moses to the pr principle of grace as a way of life. And this was not an easy transition, as we will see. Even the apostles that Jesus handpicked and personally taught had a hard time understanding the grace of God. And so I would like you to turn to Acts chapter 6 where we find the first major issue raised about the law of Moses being done away as man's way of relating to God. Acts chapter 6 In Acts chapter 6 and 7, we have the record of a very extraordinary young man. He is introduced suddenly without fanfare. Wasn't heard of before. Stephen was a man that apparently had not been a believer except for a few years. This incident happened only about two or three years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And apparently Stephen had believed in Jesus Christ shortly before he was executed. So he couldn't have been a believer very long. And we find that Stephen, however, had learned more about what Jesus really meant than even all the apostles and the other people around him. So when God had to find a man for a very special, dangerous job. He picked Stephen, not one of the apostles, because God needed a man to stand before the smartest men of the ancient times, the Sanhedrin, men who professed to know everything there was to know about God's law, the law of Moses, men who spent their whole life studying it, men who had memorized the whole Old Testament in Hebrew had memorized thousands of rabbinic interpretations of the law, who spent their time debating all the time about fine points of the meaning of the law. God chose Stephen to show these men that they knew nothing about the law. And remember, he had only been a believer no more than, at the most, three years. He also picked Stephen to show these men and convict them that they had actually executed the Messiah that their prophets had predicted for centuries. And Stephen was the one who finally brought it home 
the enormity of the crime they had committed. When Stephen did this, he knew absolutely that he was sealing his own death warrant. Well, let's look at this man. He's not heard of but once after these two chapters. But to give you some idea of how great God considered him, think of this. The book of Acts has 28 chapters. 28 chapters to record the most important history in the world. And that was how the church was founded. And two of 28 chapters are dedicated to this young man. Stephen first appears as the apostles saw the need to appoint some deacons to take care of the uh, business of the church. And uh, so we read about the qualifications of the men with Stephen in the midst. In verse 3 it says, But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good, good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procrinus and so forth. You see, he's named first. And the qualification is first and foremost that he would be a man full of, the, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word full and filling is used in a very critical sense in the New Testament. We'll be studying that a lot in future weeks. So let me digress here just for a moment to explain to you how this word is used figuratively, but how we can understand clearly what it means. If someone says to you, you're filled with rage, what does that mean? You see, it's taking an emotion and relating it to you by the word fill. But what do you understand that to mean? You see, it means that at that moment, rage has taken you over and it's controlling you. We may say a person is filled with joy. Well, we understand what that means. It's used in a metaphorical sense, filling is, but we understand it means that joy dominates your life at that moment. You see, it's used in exactly the same sense when it says he was full of faith. It means faith dominated his life. It controlled his life. But it's much more critical to understand how you can relate a person to a person by the word filling. How can a person fill a person? What does it mean? It's even used in Acts 5 of uh, of Satan filling Ananias' heart to lie, to lie to the Holy Spirit. It's used of the Holy Spirit filling a person. So what does it mean? Well, I sp <laughs> I'm baiting you here because my master's thesis at Dallas Theological Seminary was on the one word, filling. And, uh, and, and I, since I majored in Greek, I had to write a thesis from the Greek text on the word, filling. And uh, I found that if you all, and I, went, I had to go to the Sanskrit and come through some of the original languages on up to Hebrew and Greek and so forth, I found that consistently it always meant one thing, especially if you're trying to relate a person to another person by the word filling. It means to be controlled by that person doing the filling by your consent, to be controlled by your consent. And so when it says he was fill, full of the Holy Spirit, it means he was full of the Holy Spirit by his choice. He chose to depend on the Holy Spirit to guide, control, empower his life. It's one of the most important concepts you ever learn as a Christian. You can be under the control of the Holy Spirit by your choice and by depending on him. It has nothing to do with braying like a jackass speaking in some unknown tongue. 
Now, I respect the gift of speaking in tongues, and there is such a gift, and it is a, it is a gift of God. There are a lot of phonies in it, though. It can be counterfeited. But I do deeply resent those who say, you can only be filled with the Spirit if you speak in tongues. We're not talking about that. That's a gift. It has nothing to do with this moment-by-moment -moment experience of being controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, which gives you the power to live the Christian life. A gift equips you. The filling gives you the power. They're two different things. Now, Stephen was a man who understood and was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we already know he's a man ahead of his times. Now, in it continues. It says in verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So he is full of grace, which means that the principle of grace dominated his life. He understood the grace of God. That was the key to this man's usefulness to God. He understood he never, he never deserved anything from God. He would never earn anything from God. He believed God for all of the promises and power that God had available to him. He believed God for the power of the Holy Spirit, and he became the man for the moment. He was a man way ahead of his time. He was a trailblazer of the age of grace. And so it says in verse 9, but some men from uh, what was called the synagogue of freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia rose up and argued with Stephen. And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly introduced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Now, you know, in every accusation, there always has to be some ground of truth. To it. And so when they say that he's blasphemed Moses, notice they put Moses before God. You can see where their heads were. When they say he has blasphemed Moses, it meant that he must have been talking about Moses and the law. In fact, they bring it out later. It says, And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon them and dragged him away and brought him before the council. And they put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. And you know what? He did. The only thing is, they drew a wrong conclusion to what was wrong, uh, this was about. He did constantly speak against the holy place and the temple. Why? Because the false Judaism of the day had so misinterpreted the law, their traditions had so covered over the law that they couldn't understand it. And they had begun to worship the place of the temple. They began to worship the temple itself, not the God who was supposed to be represented there. And they took the law of Moses which had a very specific purpose. And they completely reversed the whole meaning of why God gave it to us. The law of Moses, you see, as we have many times in this church taught, the law of Moses was never given as a way of salvation. It was never given so we could say, oh yes, here's what God requires, and then you keep it, and then you're made right with God. No, it was given to prove as man tried to keep it and was driven to even more rebellion and broke it even more. It was given to prove by the fact that we can't keep it that we had to come by faith, not by our own merit. And they took that and reversed it and said, we can earn merit good enough for God to accept by keeping the law. In order to do this, they had to take the law and reduce it down to thousands of little rules and regulations about how you could keep the law on the outside, how you could keep the law of Moses externally. 
This is why Jesus said, you Pharisees, you wash the outside of the platter, but you don't wash the inside. He says, on the outside, you're like whitewashed tombstones. On the outside, you're beautiful, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And you see, he explained all of this in the Sermon on the Mount. He showed that the law, as far as God had, was concerned and why he had given it, always required not only obedience on the outside, but obedience on the inside, in the heart, the motives and so forth. And that's why he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, said, you've heard the elders say, you shall not murder. But I say that if you are angry with your brother without just cause, you're in danger of being judged for murder. He said, you've heard it taught you shall not commit adultery, but I say that if you look after a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart already. He said, the elders taught you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, the law commanded us to love our neighbor, but it never ever said hate your enemy. That was their deduction. They felt if you loved your neighbor, then the reverse was true. You could hate your enemy. But Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemy. Pray for those who despitefully treat you. That's the meaning of the law. What they had done was to remove the terror of the law so that they could keep it. And we must never remove the terror of the law. The law was given to strike terror in our heart as we realize how utterly fallen we are before God and how totally impossible it is to come to God by our own good deeds, by our own merit. And yet there's something of this in all of us. We all want to maintain some vestige of pride before God and we want to maintain some idea that somehow we can help God accept us. And yet the law was given to show that all of us are unacceptable. The best of us don't make it. There's no merit that will qualify us for God's presence. So that's what's behind all of this. So when, when Stephen comes to, before this council, He's coming before men who were totally blind to the meaning of the very law they claimed to uphold, they claimed to know all about. And uh, so they, they even put forth witnesses to say he had taught that the holy place, taught against the holy place and the law. And then verse 14, it explains exactly what he was saying. It says, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Now, had Jesus taught that? Absolutely. He taught. What was his last public message? Matthew 24. He said, Not one stone shall be left standing upon another in this place, which shall not be thrown down. He taught they were going to, that it was going to be destroyed. He was going to destroy the place that they had made idolatry out of the temple because that was the center of the law of Moses. Without the temple, you couldn't practice the law of Moses as God had given it. So he said, it's going to be destroyed. And also he said, you're going to be delivered from living under the law of Moses to something higher and something better. Stephen understood this, even though the 12 knuckleheads the twelve apostles, three years or so after the resurrection of Christ, still did not understand this. And this is why he couldn't use them. He had to use Stephen. Now, when he said this, and he is standing before the most brilliant men of his day, here he's just a young man, a relatively new Christian. He's standing there, but God had picked him for this mission. And it says in verse 15, fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council, that is all in the Sanhedrin, saw his face like the face of an angel. That's very interesting. You know, you think about the human element here. This means that uh, his face 
was shining. There was a glow that came from, out, from inside of his skin and, and shined like an angel's. And yet the only people who were present at this situation was the Sanhedrin and Stephen. So how did Luke learn about this later when he was writing this? Who was there? Saul of Tarsus, right. And Saul of Tarsus, who was his best friend? Luke, the physician, who wrote the book. So, you know, here it tells us that Saul was still thinking about Stephen years later. And when, when uh, Luke was writing about it, Saul told him, we all saw his face like the face of an angel. He never forgot it. Now, the high priest said to him, are these things so? Before Stephen opened his mouth, he knew he was sealing his death warrant. But I want you to see the courage of this man. I want you to see what being filled with the Holy Spirit, understanding the grace of God produces. It shows us a foretaste of the power that's available to every believer today. He begins to defend himself before these brilliant men who spent their life studying the law of Moses by tracing from the beginning of their history in the scripture. By this, this was all done extemporaneously. He traces through the scripture from the beginning of their history with Abraham and shows consistently all the way down through their history that they did not understand the law. And he begins to trace carefully that the Messiah and his true purpose had been predicted all through their history. And he goes through this in, a, in probably the most eloquent message recorded in the Word of God. I mean, you can just see that only the Holy Spirit could have equipped and worked through this man with such wisdom, with such crystal sharp logic. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. And so as he goes through here and produces things they could not deny because they knew the Old Testament, and he would show a new insight at each point down through the history that they couldn't deny. And he finally comes down to verse 46. He says, and he found, and David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Now, of what was Stephen charged? He was charged of blaspheming God and the holy place. He was charged of blaspheming because he had said the holy place would be destroyed. Here he's about to prove that God had said that this would become such a problem in the history of Israel that it would be destroyed. So he says, verse 48, However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophets say, he proves his point, each point, all the way down through from the Old Testament, which they had to agree with. So he quotes Isaiah 66, verse 1. Heaven is my throne, the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? And then he adds to that Isaiah 66 verse 2 he says or what place is there for my repose was it not my hand which made all of these things so what he shows them is that they had made idolatrous worship out of the place and they had forgotten that God had built all of these things they had forgotten that God doesn't dwell 
in temples made with hands. That was not his purpose. And so he shows them that they had made an idolatry out of that place. And he shows them that's why God was going to judge. You know, I can't pass this without saying in much of Christianity today, there's been idolatry about the church buildings. For instance, today, if someone says the word church, what's the instant mental image? A building usually with a steeple on it and stained glass and all of that, etc. Do you know what? That's not the church. That's the place where the church meets. And there has been a tremendous shift in what was originally intended. You see, in the first three centuries of the church, there were no buildings. They met in fields, gymnasiums, caves, the catacombs of Rome. They met in many places. And then by the grace of God, the way was opened up for Christianity to at least be accepted without feeding them the lions. And so they started building buildings, and that became a curse because the buildings became the focus instead of the church, which is the people, the church made up of believers in Jesus Christ. So that today we have followed for centuries an idolatry that is pouring most of the money that comes in for the church into buildings. This is not to say we shouldn't have an adequate, comfortable place that uh, is good for having a meeting and, and uh, there is a sense in which we set apart a place so that it's set apart for a special purpose and so forth. But when we go over to spending billions of dollars into making these palaces, we're completely missing the point. A man who chose to be born in a stable did not intend for himself to be worshipped in palaces. But rather that money ought to be spent more, for build, more than for buildings on supplying ministers for the ministry and financing missions to the people who need to hear the gospel. But most of the wealth has been spent on buildings. I never, by the grace of God, ever want some big mansion-like stone thing with all of the paraphernalia that usually is associated with a church. I don't want to get confused. I'd rather be focused on what's the really important thing. That is, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. You know? Now he comes to his point in verse 51. He has made his point by going through history, history they couldn't deny, punctuating it with, with the eloquence of the Holy Spirit from the scripture. And now he, he knows he's sealing his death warrant here. He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit and are doing just as your fathers did. He showed their fathers had missed the point all down through their history of the true mission of the coming Messiah. He says, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Wow. He says, I haven't blasphemed the law. I haven't blasphemed the temple. You have. And you have murdered the one the prophets predicted would come. Verse 53, he drives the shaft deeper into their heart. He says, you received the law as ordained by angels, and yet 
did not keep it. Nothing could have made them more angry. Here are men who claimed they knew everything about the law. They thought they were acceptable to God by the way they kept it. And yet he says, you received it by angels and you have not kept it. You know, if these people set apart by God, dedicated as a people to the law of Moses, could not keep it, what chance do you and I have? You know, if these people set apart by God, dedicated as a people to the law of Moses, could not keep it, what chance do you and I have? And so Stephen sees with the insight that only the Spirit could have given him that the law had been replaced as God said it would come by something better. And so he says, all right, it says, now when they heard this, they, the Sanhedrin, were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. You see, he got it through. He convicted them. They couldn't resist the truth of what he said. But you know something? Understanding something does not mean you're going to accept it. And when you understand the truth of God's word, and you reject it, the reaction is sometimes violent. And because they would not accept it, they would not believe, they were driven to madness. They were gnashing their teeth. These big cultured, educated men were gnashing their teeth like wild dogs because they couldn't resist what was said and yet they wouldn't believe it because they didn't choose to believe it. And so it says, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You know, Stephen was completely in another place. He was standing in the midst of people who were about to, to kill him in a very cruel way. But he was already in his mind and heart in another place. He stared intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit gave this man so many honors, but this is the greatest. The Holy Spirit records for all time something that was done as an extraordinary act of uh, glory for this man. Because Psalm 110 says that the Messiah Jesus right now sits at the right hand of the Father. Here he's standing. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that Jesus stood up to welcome the man who introduced the age of grace, the man who was the greatest example of what the Holy Spirit can do when a man is totally given over to trusting him. The scripture says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for those whose hearts are right before him in order that he might show himself mighty in their behalf. And here he has done it. Here is one that would stand in the breach. Here is one whose heart was right before him. And that means to have, to have a right heart doesn't mean to be sinless. It means to understand that by the grace of God, you never deserved anything from God, and you never will.
but that all God has is available to you if you want to serve him and you just receive his power through the Holy Spirit. And that's what he did. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereign of the universe, stood to receive him. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He, desired, he died with the same words on his lips that Jesus had died with. Jesus had said, into your hands I commit my spirit. Stephen said, Lord Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. Receive my spirit. A very important little footnote here, and only Saul could have given this insight too. The witnesses put their robes at the feet of Saul. You know why? Because according to the laws of the Sanhedrin, the one who brought the charges held the cloaks of the one who stoned them. So Saul was the one who put this young man on trial. Apparently Saul's pride had been mortally wounded by the wisdom of this young man who refuted him in every way. And that pride would not let it rest. He brought charges against him and he's the one that, that brought charges that brought against his death. You know, Saul, who became Paul the Apostle, never forgot this. When he is giving his testimony before King Agrippa much, many years later, he talks about the fact that I was a witness against Stephen when he was brought to death. So I believe that from this time on, there were hooks put in Saul's subconscious that eventually resulted in his salvation. He fought vigorously against what Stephen stood for, but he couldn't apparently forget what he saw in this man. His face had shined as an angel. And Saul had never heard a man speak like this. He had never heard such brilliance at expounding the Word of God. And that would have been something that would have stayed with him. So the law was announced as being finished finally by Stephen. But after this, there were still problems. In Acts chapter 10, Peter, this is many years later, this would have been about a year or two later, I guess. Peter was uh, preaching to the Jews, as were all the apostles, and none of them were going to the Gentiles, except Philip. Philip had gone to the Samaritans who were part Gentile. And so Peter had to have a special revelation from God and a vision before he would overcome the traditions that he himself had been steeped in. Now Jesus had told them what to do. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. He told them they were to go to the uttermost parts of the world of the Gentiles. And yet tradition was so strongly embedded in these people because of the law that they'd been taught in a false way that they couldn't get over even what Jesus had commanded them. And so it took a special revelation from God where he rebuked Peter in a vision for this to make Peter be willing to go to talk to Gentiles. And God said in the vision, there are Gentiles going to come to you and you go with them when they come. So they came and they took him to a Roman colonel's house. He was a centurion, which would be equivalent to a colonel in the army today. And this man, Cornelius, a colonel in the Roman army, had gathered all the others who were seeking to find God. And Cornelius 
was so trying to find God that he had gone to the Jews and he had even given money to the temple in Jerusalem. But he had not found him. But you know something? God says to anyone anywhere in the world, whether you're in the darkest of Africa, whether you're in Lapland, or an aborigine in the heart of the outback of Australia, or a bombed out rapper in America. No matter where you are, he says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Don't give me this stuff about what about the heathen. <laughs> that somehow God's not fair to them because, you know, they don't have a fair shake at hearing the gospel. Anyone anywhere who wants to know God, God will send someone to him. He'll get the message somehow. And it's the case of that here in Acts 10. And Peter, against his tradition and will, is made to go and he speaks and in verse 43 the moment he gives the gospel it says of Jesus all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin literally it re has received its aorist tense in the original Greek everyone who believes in him has received forgiveness of sins now that's really good news because what that's saying is that when you believe you're forgiven all sin past present and future God doesn't give salvation on the Lindley's program it isn't in installments it comes all at once in total when you believe Jesus Christ died in your place and paid the penalty for your breaking God's laws thought word a deed then at that moment the pardon he purchased for you with your name on it is credited to your account and you're forgiven all sin past present and future you have been forgiven sin and that gospel is great no wonder they call it good news that is good news and so the moment these Romans under the colonel's house heard this they believed and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in tongues they received the gift of tongues so that outwardly they could see what had just taken place on the inside and they received exactly the same sign that the Jews had received on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 they received the same sign as the part Jews did in Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans. And now they receive it. Now, why do you think God gave this outward sign that would be the same in each case? Do you see? To show that they were received equally on an equal basis. To show that they were now equal with Jews. To show that they were received in the same way that they had. And that's the same defense that uh, Peter gives. Because after this happened, it says in chapter 11, verse 1, Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Now you'd think they would have rejoiced and said, Praise the Lord, how gracious God is. But instead we read, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him and said you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them see that was strictly forbidden by tradition and you see tradition in all religions tends to become more important than the original revelation and we're not free of it today it's been a curse to the church all down through its history Whenever tradition comes up against the Word of God, usually people choose tradition. And so they're rubbing this in on Peter. They're demanding that he defend himself because he's gone in and ate with them. They, never mind they received 
salvation and have eternal life. We want to know why you went in, you see. Well, Peter gives them, you know, you have to realize the Holy Spirit has great power because here's the man that only opened his mouth to change feet all the way through the Gospels, and now he's speaking eloquently. Here's a tremendous defense that he gives here. And uh, in verse 17, he sums it up by saying, If God therefore gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? <laughs> so it's an eloquent defense. And notice, he says, okay, they, got, they spoke in tongues, which was the outward sign, the same as we did. Now, see, Operation Transition, we'll learn more about this next week when we talk about specifically the transition from everyone not having the Holy Spirit, only a selected few on a conditional, limited basis, where it transitioned to today in the age of grace where every believer has the Holy Spirit on an unconditional basis forever. Now, what a transition. And it shows the transition that took place through the book of Acts. And it shows that what happened in these cases was not to be the standard, typical experience. And that's where people get in so much trouble. Today, we've got people trying to duplicate everything that took place during the transition. And yet the norm for today is clearly spelled out in the epistles, particularly 1 Corinthians, where it says, all do not speak in tongues, do they? And it requires a negative answer. It says that the Holy Spirit distributes the spiritual gifts severally as he wills, not as we will. And so it shows that not everyone's going to get this gift, but in this instant where there was God chose a certain sign to show the equality of people, to show that the same thing was taking place and people were accepted on an equal basis. He chose to give that outward sign. But that was not to be the continuing thing because after one generation, the transition was done. Now, in Acts chapter 15 which was many years later. We have the first church council. Now, the Apostle Paul has already been on missionary journeys. Uh, there's been a spread of Christianity through many different places. And uh, there's been tremendous progress of the gospel among the Gentiles. And so we read in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, And some men came down from Judea, that is to the, to, to the place where the uh, Gentile church headquarters was, and it says, They came down from Judea and began teaching, brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now Paul's already written by this time, uh, some epistles. He may have even written the, the epistle of Galatians by this time. But uh, certainly, he has, if he hadn't written it, he has taught that the law of Moses was done away and that we're now under the age of grace, the principle of grace. And these people coming down from Jerusalem are still hung up with the traditions of the law of Moses. And, uh, you know, today, by the way, we have male children circumcised because doctors have realized it is a good thing to do. It is a physically healthy thing to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if someone is circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses so that you'll be more acceptable to God, then it becomes an issue. Because, you see, the law of Moses was a whole package. You couldn't choose to pick one uh, part of it and keep it. The moment you did, you were under the obligation to keep the whole law because it dealt with the assumption that if you keep the law, you have some kind of merit to bring you to God. And so if you choose one part of the law, you've got to keep it all. Paul brings this out in Galatians chapter 5. 
So it says in verse 2, and Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. Now imagine, I'd love to have been there at that. Imagine they really raised a ruckus. And it says, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning the issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed, stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Uh-oh. Now here we are, years after the resurrection of Christ, years after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in every believer, and they are still hung up with tradition instead of God's truth. They're still trying to put people under the law of Moses. Well, that's not so bad. We've got Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Baptists who are still trying to do this. And they don't even have the excuse that they were born Pharisees. They just became one. And all over the place, we find those that are still, one way or another, trying to put people under a system of merit to gain God's acceptance. And so it says that uh, the apostles in verse 6, oh, no, let's see. Uh, yeah, the apostles in verse 6 uh, and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after they had been, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Period. Now, the most eloquent thing Peter ever did was put a period after belief because there isn't anything else required. And it says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. What, what an insight. Here was Peter, a Jew, confessing that the nation of Israel that had been set apart, created and set apart, given the law of Moses, tested under the special conditions of the law of Moses, he says, we received it, we always misunderstood it, and we never kept it. He says, now if we, a chosen nation, protected of God, set apart and our people dedicated to the law and trying to keep it, if we couldn't keep it, why are we trying to put Gentiles under it? And that is extremely good logic, the logic of the Holy Spirit. He says, we have not been able to bear it. And he says, verse 11, but we believe that we are saved through the what? The grace, it's the age of grace, through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. And the multitude kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. He says, Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about uh, taking for himself gen uh, from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with these words, the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Now he quotes from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. 
And the particular point he's making is taken from the statement, verse 17, where it says, all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Because he says the prophets recognize that Gentiles are to be brought into the family of God. Now, I don't think even, uh, even uh, James understood fully what he was quoting here because this is a passage that refers to the second coming of Jesus the Messiah and it refers to what's going to happen at that time. He's going to rebuild the, t the tabernacle of David, that is the temple, which had fallen down. In other words, which had been in ruins. And that's what we see during the age of the church, the age of grace. And he says that he's going to restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by his name. You see, this shows that during this period of the tabernacle being down, the Gentiles would be saved. So it, it shows dispensationally, very correctly, what was to happen. Now, he says, Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. All right, notice who was in charge of this first church council. Was it Peter? No, no it was James. On his authority as the leader, he says, it is my judgment that we do not trouble the Gentiles. You see, the leader of the church, the first leader of the church was James. So if there were such a thing as a pope, who would have been the first? James, not Peter. <laughs> what a ripoff we've had in history. Is that, you know... Peter was just one of the boys. He testified. He was one of the leaders, yes, but he was not the, the, the supreme leader. The supreme leader of the church was James. And James passed the verdict of the first church council. The Gentiles are not required to keep the law of Moses. And this began to then work out into the messages that Paul, uh, he had already been saying it, but now they really work out in messages as he goes along. And po uh, from this point on, Paul began to literally spread the gospel everywhere, all over the outer regions of the Roman Empire. And after many years, almost 30 years, Paul, in his humanness, decides he can't stand it anymore. He wants to go back to his beloved Jerusalem the place that was so dear to him as a Jew. And he wanted to go back and see the temple, and he wanted to see the places that were so dear in his childhood and all of the religious things that were so dear to him. And he says he's going up to Jerusalem, come hell or high water. And God twice tells him not to go. And he sends prophets to tell him not to go. And the prophets warn him that he's going to go through terrible times if he goes up to Jerusalem but he goes anyway now the fact that he goes anyway tells us something if God specifically tells you even with prophets that you're not to do something and you do it anyway what are you doing you're sinning and it means at that time you have interrupted the Holy Spirit's control on your life because known sin causes the Holy Spirit to stop leading, guiding, and empowering you to convicting you. So we know he was out of the will of God and he was out of fellowship. And it soon begins to become obvious because he goes up to Jerusalem. And uh, the reason I bring this out is to show you how tenacious a pull the law has on the old flesh. Even the great apostle Paul, the champion of grace, falls here. It says uh, in chapter 21, verse 18, or 17, And when we had come to Jerusalem, we means Luke and Paul, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and now the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now notice, 
He goes into who? James, because he's the leader. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard, heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, now I want you to notice, they give glory to God, yes. But what is uppermost in the mind of these leaders of the church? The next thing tells it. It says in verse 20, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous of grace. Is that what it says? No, they're all zealous of the law. Thirty years, they haven't gotten it straight. One of the reasons God destroyed Jerusalem was a judgment on the Jerusalem church. Because they wouldn't get it straight. Tradition bound them. And they go on in verse 21 and say, And they have been told about you, Paul, that you're teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Did Paul teach that? Yes, he did. You ever read the epistle of the Galatians? He said, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified. I don't know where you may be right now in your Christian life. Maybe you've blown it pretty badly. God says, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jesus was fully aware that he was God in the flesh, incarnate deity. He boldly declared he came from God. He actually was God. He was to be worshipped. He could forgive people of their sins, which only God had the power to do. He would rise from the dead. He would return to the Father to prepare a dwelling place for his children. He would one day return to the earth to take us with him to heaven. Those declarations are too powerful to be ignored. If Jesus said these things about himself, we're faced with a question that he asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Millions of people will tell you, I believe Jesus was a great moral teacher, but I don't accept him and his claims to be God. As C.S. Lewis, the brilliant British scholar, said of Jesus in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil himself from hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with that patronizing nonsense about his being just a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. There's only one intellectually honest conclusion after you objectively consider all the facts. He is the promised Messiah, the son of the living God, one hymn writer put it beautifully. The word became flesh and died as my savior. What mercy, what love, and what grace.